So welcome everyone. For anyone who's attending this call for the first time, we hold this industry-wide call every month for any company who wants to participate in the cultivated meat value chain. For anyone who's wondering where Elliot is, um, he's fine, he just had a conflict. Um, and so my name is Claire, I'm filling in for him today. Um, so the purpose of these calls is to introduce and welcome new solutions providers into the cultivated meat industry with the end goal of establishing new collaborations that will accelerate R&D and commercialization. If your group is interested in presenting on a future call, or if you're working with a company that may benefit from being on these calls, please, please feel free to put them in touch with Elliot, who normally uh, organizes these calls. I'll drop his email in the chat. Um, so first thing I think I, I have to mention is uh, yesterday was a, a pretty big um a pretty big news day from a regulatory standpoint. So two cultivated meat companies now have approval to sell cultivated meat in the US. Um, so this is a pretty big milestone, hopefully followed by more big milestones. Um, and so huge collab huge congratulations to uh, Good Meat and Upside. Um, I'm very excited to see where, where we go from, from that, big, that big milestone. Um, and so just a, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we recently published the results from our cell lines survey, which discusses industry trends and needs and features data collection from data collected from over 40 companies. Um, and huge thank you to everyone who participated in that survey. I'm just going to drop that link in the chat. Um, and then related to that, we currently have another survey um, on microbiological testing that's currently live. Um, and so this survey is being performed in collaboration with the Future Ready Food Safety Hub in Singapore. Um, it should take about 10 minutes to complete, um, and it should be completed by companies that manufacture cultivated meat. So if that's you, I will drop the link here. Um, and then for anyone doing research in the cultivated seafood space, we're piloting a new event next month. Um, it'll be July 11th at 8.30 a.m. Pacific. Um, we're calling it Collaborative Huddle for Ideation and Problem Solving, or Fish and Chips. Um, it's a little bit experimental. We'll see how it goes, um, but I'm excited for it. Um, and so the goal of this event is really to foster connections between cultivated seafood researchers and to provide a forum to exchange ideas and collaboratively troubleshoot research challenges. So if you are a researcher working on cultivated seafood and you want to connect with other researchers working on cultivated seafood. Uh, oh, thank you, Renee. Um, and then finally, um, Elliot, um, the, the usual host of these calls, um, shared with me that he, he just posted um, on LinkedIn a uh, sort of letter related to the uh, the bioarchive preprint that some of you may have seen out of UC Davis that goes into environmental impacts of cultivated meat. Um, and Renee just dropped that in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, so if anyone's interested in seeing where that conversation is going, um, please feel free to check that out. Okay, and that's it for housekeeping. So for today's speakers, I'm pleased to welcome Nataraji Adavali from Cytonest, who will be uh, talking about their nanofiber scaffolding technology. And then after that, we'll turn it over to Kyle McGuire and Christopher Buller from Optics 11 Life, who will be speaking today about their technology for high throughput biomechanics characterization. Um, and please feel free to drop questions in the chat throughout. We can get them, we can get to them at the end. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Nataraja. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome all. Um, thank you all for tuning in from different time zones and different countries. Um, so, my name is Nataraja. Uh, you can call me uh, for ease as a Raja. Uh, I am the co-founder and the CEO of our startup, Cytonest INC. So, Cytonest is a B two B startup. Uh, we we founded the company to serve cultivated meat and seafood industry overall. Um, so we are currently located in the University of Georgia startup incubator space. Fortunately, next to uh, animal health and meat science department. So we are learning a lot from the resources available to us surrounding. Um, so our startup is currently developing a scaffold based platform technologies, uh, which enables cultivate meat and seafood production. And we remain focused on the whole cut meat format uh, because that's a critical bottleneck in the industry right now. And finally, uh, we are proud. Uh, Cytonest is a GFI grantee, current grantee. And as a part of this grant support, uh, we are developing edible scaffolds and platform technologies for cultivated seafood applications, particularly. 
So before we jump into our scaffolding technology and the products we are offering to the industry, uh, let us take a quick look very briefly on the world traditional meat production market. So this is the data available from the UN uh, FAO data spanning from 1961 to 2021 and by the year 2021 we can clearly see here that the world meat production is standing at 350 million tons per year and dominated by three species here poultry pig meat and the buff beef and finally a bulk of this meat is produced by two major nations us and china um, as just claire mentioned right now uh, some of the cultivated meat industries a couple of them good meat and upside they received the USDA clearance to sell their cultivated chicken products. Uh, this is a great uh, junction point now. The industry is opening the doors for all the customers. Um, so here, the cultivated meat industry is trying to replace or at least take a contribution, give a contribution to replace some of these traditional meat products. And it's a, I think it's a good point for us to take a look at the manufacturing process that is involved in bringing this whole cultivated meat products into the market. So as we all know, these are all our observations, so they might change as we learn more from the industry. So the current meat manufacturing technologies are really focused on cell expansion in suspension culture systems, like traditional bioreactors, or right now we're calling them cultivators. And these bioprocessing technologies are really adapted from the biopharma industry. Of course, we made a lot of modifications. I mean, the, generally, the industry made a lot of modifications and improved the technologies to suit for the cultivated meat production but these are originally designed for a high cost and low volume products like uh, vaccines, cell metabolites, or any cell extracted compounds. Uh, generally, those kind of products, they generate very high revenue, uh, but what cultivated meat industry uh, is re really needed is a low cost and high volume products, uh, which can compete with the traditional meat products. So we are at a very junction. Uh, the, of course, adapting this technology is great, and we need to uh, demonstrate that the products are feasible for the market. Uh, apart from this current challenge with the manufacturing process, which requires to be developed further as we go forward with successes, um, whole cut meat production is really a bottleneck. We can expand the cells to large quantities in the big cultivators um, across multi-acre installations, but how do we take these cells and put them into a structure? That's a really, really a bottleneck issue. And there are plenty of, uh, uh, in initiatives across the industry that like based upon three bioprinting or uh, other scaffolds or or letting the cell do the job to create its own ECM, create a structure. Uh, so despite all these technologies available, uh, we are still lacking a whole cut meat product in the market. Uh, so this slide here, we are just taking a quick look, uh, taking a step deep into the market manufacturing process. So we all know three primary ingredients, cell, media and scaffold. In the last two, three years, actually last half a decade, uh, the first two ingredients, cell and the media, uh, the amount of research went in and the, uh, the overall industry witnessed a lot of success in these two ingredients. A lot of commercial cell lines are developed successfully, immortalized and uh, a serum-free media, plant-based proteins, ingredients developed for the culture media part but scaffold is still a bottleneck issue. That's what we are stressing on today and our offerings to the industry. So why the current scaffolds, despite their advantage, for example, bioprinting is a leading technology that allows for us to print a red meat in a whole cut format, which is not possible from traditional means uh, or other scaffolding technologies available in the market. So we see here, uh, a major disadvantages, which are really a kind of tough, tough nut, tough, tough nut to crack. So, the first issue here: the poor cell diffusion and proliferation into, into these scaffolds, because we are trying to uh, mimic a extracellular matrix of a, uh, a, of a meat tissue. So, immediately the first problem we face is that cells are nice to adhere on the surface, but they how do they diffuse into the whole scaffold and how do they proliferate without causing necrosis? And then as the cell density is increasing in the scaffold, how do we maintain the media uh, passing from the scaffold to outside environment and the metabolites and gas exchange, everything. And finally, how do we make sure that um, the scaffold percentage in the whole cut meter, the end product remains small. Currently, even bioprinting at environment or uh, other scaffolds, uh, the scaffold percentage, weight percentage in the dry weight is much higher than the meat, actual meat co composition. So 
so uh, I'm just taking a step by step here, going deep into what the scaffold really is here for us. So let's define a, a scaffold that might be more appealing for the cultural meat industry here. The right side, little left side graphic is put forward by Claire and their team from the GFI. I think this is a great, uh, a great image here that can show us what a typical tissue looks like at, at its structure. Uh, generally, uh, the tissues are really in a, in, a, in a given animal. If you're harvesting the meat from different organs, the extracellular matrix and the tissue structure is completely different. So we are not trying to recreate each and every tissue organ here. But understanding some basic components of a tissue will give us a better definition of a scaffold. So here what we see quickly on the left side, uh, we see a muscle tissue and a muscle tissue containing a fascicle. So each fascicle having a, uh, again, further muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers having the actual cell components. And this is also represented well for the fish structure. Uh, so what we can do right now here, let us separate what is ECM in this muscle structure and what is a cell that is actually multiplied in the cultivator. So if you look here, the myofibril part, the central core part where the actin myosin uh, myofibril is being developed by cells, these are actual cells uh, which are uh, either in the satellite state or in the primary cell state. These are multiplied in the cultivators, but the surrounding sheets, uh, these uh, uh, endomycium and perimycium and the overall epimycium, these sheets, they cannot be produced easily in a cultivator. Um, so looking at uh, this structure further by Peter et al., um, they did an excellent work to give us a kind of glimpse of how this structure looks like and what are the individual features and dimensions of this structure here. So the the fascicle part is shown, let's say this is a fascicle here, if you can follow my mouse pointer. And within that one, we have the myofibril part regions. So, so individual, after the extracellular matrix is extracted, so decellularized scaffold, what we're seeing here in a same image. So individual uh, capsules here are the structures, they're expanded here. Each one is actually ranging from 20 micrometer to 50 micrometer in diameter. And within that, the muscle fibrils are uh, fi uh, myofibrils are being developed uh, as a tissue. And another interesting thing that we need to understand here when we're recreating a ECM, which is also called a scaffold here, uh, the muscle development is actually initiated with embryogenesis. So as the embryo is being developed and splitting into multiple cells, uh, they differentiate into a muscle tissue. And then this tissue is being developed for months or years together as the animal is growing in its lifespan. But if we recreate this entire ECM as is in a, in a physical world or synthetic uh, work in, in, a, in a lab, uh, there's a, again, we are, we are bumping into the same issues. How can the cells diffuse into such a small structures deep into the 3D structure? How can the media go through? And, and also we are missing to talk about the, the vasculature here that's shown. So these are all the ingredients that are come important for a whole cut meat to develop uh, in a tank or in a, uh, in a lab grown conditions. And so uh, what we did here before we even start our startup company and we did a lot of background research, what is defining a scaffold properly and what, what are the limitations of the scaffold and what we, how we can recreate the meat in artificial conditions. So looking into different, um, different technologies like bioprinting or other scaffold like mycelium based or even other fiber based scaffolds and electrospun scaffolds and hydrogels. So we learned a lot from the last 20 years in the tissue engineering environment, but tissue engineering scaffolds are really made for the biocompatibility. They are not really made for the edible uh, function or kind of scaffolds we're trying to create. So looking into all the data, what we conclude is that um, a fiber based structure is more advantageous here. For example, if you can see here, uh, these are all nanofibers. And these nanofibers into developed into sheets, mainly collagen, and they make up like overall this ECM. What we what we see here, the intracellular, intramuscular, extracellular matrix. This one, when we dry the entire tissue, they make up only ten percent of the dry weight. So that means they are very small composition, but they're playing a big role in the overall tissue feel, like bite feel for us in the meat. And so. A fiber-based scaffold is still advantageous. It's it's it is a more appropriate scaffold. Um, but what kind of features? Uh, what are the what are these advantages? We'll show it here. 
So when we just said fibers are integral part of the muscle tissue and they are actually giving the fibrous structure in the meat. When we cut the meat or when we cook the meat, uh, when the bite feel everything is really coming from the fibrous structure and the flavor is coming from the ingredients. So these fiber scaffolds, uh, they are more appealing uh, definitely because they are, they are fibers. And what they, can, what they can help to the cultivated meat industry generally, they re definitely reduce the manufacturing process. Imagine a cultivator producing cells in the suspension culture, and then we are combining that, harvesting those cells, and then putting through the, putting them through a composite composition, bio inks, for example, or other scaffolds here in this case, and then maintaining the sterility of the conditions, and then recreating and packing them with other machines to get a whole cut meat structure is very complicated. So they involve, they are increasing the amount of labor process and number of uh, processing steps and the cost overall. Uh, using a scaffold, uh, we will be able to solve many of these problems if we can integrate the scaffold with the cultivator directly. And um, improved meat stru structure integrated definitely. Sca generally fibers are individually, maybe they're they are fragile, but when we create a 3D scaffold, individual fibers put together, they increase the strength of the overall uh, 3D structure tremendously the mechanical strength. So they definitely put the meat structure integrity at the end. And it's easy to customize the cell fiber with the different coatings, different structure, different components. Finally, scaffolds can be made with a single ingredient, one kind of protein, one kind of polysaccharide, which helps in the overall clean label formation. For example, if you make the end product, take a look at the, the ingredients list in the end made product, and we can make sure that the clean labels uh, policy can be applied to that one using scaffolds, fiber-based scaffolds. And overall, even looking at the fine end product composition, we can increase the meat percentage, meat composition, and reduce the amount of scaffold percentage or uh, overall ingredients of going to scaffold the bio biopolymers. And scaffolds can be collected from the off the shelf. So there is a great advantage. We don't require to create a recreate a bio ink every time or recreate a other scaffold, or prepare a special scaffold every time. We can create them early, put them on the shelf and take it off the shelf. Uh, so taking another step now, let's see, we considering all these advantages, how can we create and what is a scaffold should look like uh, for this kind of uh, circumstances. Uh, this is a data left side panel collected from my Howdy Kitchen. They put up a great article on a traditional meat and how the stick uh, thickness and stick uh, dimensions are varying depending upon uh, type of uh, muzzle cut we, we are getting. So looking at the dimensions here, let's focus on that one. Uh, I think 0.5 inch or 1.5 centimeter. That's the lowest thickness of the meat we, we, we are looking at. And up to 7.6 centimeters or eight centimeters, that's the, the largest thickness. So this thickness is very important when we consider the bite field. For example, cooking, overcooking or undercooking, this is defined by the thickness of the meat and the mode of the cooking process. And so let's take a, a, a random a symmetric structure, a rectangle brick-like structure. Uh, that should span around 15 centimeters plus or minus according to this, to emulate the meat structure here and a depth of 10 to 15 centimeters and a, and a thickness of around 1.5 to 7.5 centimeters. So let's imagine that there's a scaffold of this size with the multiple nanofibers crisscrossed and layer by layer the structures are arranged. So if we create that kind of scaffold, my apologies, if we create this kind of scaffold, what are we looking at here? From a scaffold perspective, so the scaffold should be made of edible material. So it should have a defined, fiber diameter, which is suitable for the cell to attach and grow from there. And overall, the structure should create enough porosity, the pore size, uh, which matches the cell, so that cell can diffuse through. So diffusion is the main problem we discussed. So if you create such a kind of thick tissue with uh, at least 200 to 2,000 layers of nanofibers, imagine the space within and how the cell can reach all the way to the depths of the scaffold and uniformly distribute all over the scaffold. So that requires a good control of the porosity. So structural control is very important here. And overall, once we immerse this entire scaffold into a culture media, either a static or dynamic culture or a perfusion culture, uh, the scaffold should re retain its uh, original shape. It should not uh, collapse or it should not swell into a kind of gel. So most of the edible materials are hygroscopic. And then there should be a vasculature. We have seen that is a, it's very important for the cells to remain healthy as they grow for multiple weeks up to seven, 10 weeks. Uh, the media should continue to perfuse and keeping the scaffold and cell healthy without causing any necrosis. 
and then finally introduced in the biochemical cues. So if you see just from the scaffold perspective, a lot of science needs to be developed here, uh, which makes which which keeps the entire structures uh, together. And from the cell perspective, when we combine this one with the culture media and the cells, first of all, the cells should find this fiber surface uh, good enough for the adhesion. Once the cells attach to this fiber, they should be able to conveniently proliferate, finding the environment suitable for them, and then reaching optimal cell density without causing necrosis. And then further, if it is a satellite cell or a stem cell, we should be able to differentiate it to the muscle cell. And finally, the last very important, the fat tissue and the muscle tissue is important in the red meat, the color variations you can see here. So co-culture feasibility. If we can bring all these parameters and, and put together into a scaffold, that's a real scaffold we are looking for to successfully create a whole cut meat. Um, so that's what uh, inspiration for us in our product development or startup, even founding a startup to bring all these scientific parameters and see what is the best structure we can issue. So as a part of this last two years with the help of GFI and other research activities, uh, we developed a proprietary uh, a mechanical fiber drawing technology, which is not similar to electro spinning technique or any other technique available in the market, which is unique. Uh, it's a low cost uh, technique, uh, low energy, very high energy efficient. And we also developed 3D scaffolding technologies. For example, it's easy to draw a bunch of fibers, but it's very difficult to draw a single filament fiber and handle it. This is the biggest uh, uh, upside down situation. People generally can produce individual components and then put together, making the bulk production is difficult, but ability to draw a single filament ultra long uh, micro nanofiber and holding it in a place and creating a 3D structure uh, is a, is a it's a kind of quite challenging task here. Only by doing so, we'll be able to create all the scientific points we discussed above in the previous slide. So we achieved that task with a proprietary mechanical fiber drawing, MFT technologies. And so these fibers are really drawn from grass approved. So it's USFDA grass approved materials only, it's polysaccharides and proteins. There are no synthetic materials involved in our process. So we achieved a very good control on the fiber handling and positioning. So that leads us to issue highest fiber fiber spacing here and also higher, very good lay to lay spacing. So we can define the space and we can issue within a marginal error uh, and we can keep the structure integ in integrated. And what, what we are able to issue here, so vasculature, that's very important, which is missing in most of the scaffolds out there, including bioprinted, um, structures uh, when we keep the structure in culture media for 10 weeks or two weeks for maturation purposes can we maintain this uh, can we create a vasculature gap between the layers so the cells are confined to individual layers while the media is exchanged because we all know that from the tissue engineering research environment 200 micron thickness is the limit for the individual layers beyond that cells will start ne undergoing necrosis because they're exhausted from the uh, required nutrients and gas exchange and everything. So if we create a 200 micron thick structure with multiple layers and the cavities and everything for the cells to sit and multiply nicely and leaving behind a, a 200 micron or a finer micron, whichever we would like to see according to the size of the structure and the environment and scale up everything. If we, we assured a structure that can leave a gap and then build another layer of structure. So this gap is very efficient, which we are calling right now as a media exchange channel or a micro perfusion channel, micro, micro perfusion system overall. Uh, we proved that this technology is working. We'll see some of the results in the coming slides. So overall, we achieved a structure uh, that, that meets all the above scientific challenges we put forward in the, in the, above in the previous slides. And um, these are some of the examples. What you see here, we are able to draw edible nanofibers with the controlled spacing between the fibers in the 3D shape. And we are able to create a 3D structure. If you see at the edge here, following my mouse, there are fibers of different diameters. So we control, we issued the fiber diameter control, we issued the fiber spacing, and also we also issued the 3D structure development. And we can see creating the cavities here. And we also issued a rotational orientation, like how the fibers can be spaced in 3D, 3D environment. And so we built a scaffold that that's looks like uh, optimum for the um, market and meat applications. And again, these, these are some of the customization options. For example, uh, 
structure is one thing we have seen clearly putting the structure with the cell and making the cell to grow in it is a, a big challenge in itself so we created a customization possibility because we assured the control on the fiber uh, at the very single, uh, very basic so edible materials so we tested around 27 different materials in the last two years across the uh, kitchen ingredients let's say polysaccharides proteins and then once we created fiber we tested their stability in the culture in the culture environment when we immerse the fiber into the into the culture media how much the fibers swell how much the fiber stretch and how what happens to the overall 3d structure when the fiber undergoes such a kind of hydrodynamic stress and so we create we created edible materials sorted a list which are more stable for 10 weeks or 30 days at least in a hydrodynamic environment and we we also reached a porosity level because we have full control of the porous uh, fiber handling we can create a structure like a aerogel let's say call it but it's not really aerogel that means the least amount of fiber material going into largest structure yet creating the pockets that we need so we can reach a porosity up to 85 percent by controlling into fiber and layer to layer gap spacing everything and scaffold size so currently we are in a prototyping facility phase we are a early stage startup so with our prototype facility we are able to produce structures up to 300 cubic centimeter volume that's like a 10 centimeter by 15 centimeter by two centimeter. So a small uh, brick-like structure handling in your hand. But the technologies that we develop are scalable and they are energy efficient, low cost. That means we are able to produce up to 3000 cubic centimeters when we have the final manufacturing facility available source setup. And also we created a fiber diameter control. So different cells in different regions of the scaffold requires different diameters. So we can we actually control with, with a step of uh, every two to three micron up to one to 100 micron range fiber diameter control. Biochemical cues. This is a very interesting research topic in the last 20 years, actually, core shell fibers, how to bring in the coatings onto the fiber. So the technology is well established and biochemical coatings are very convenient. If you want to bring in some specific growth factors or cell specific addition molecule proteins onto the fiber surface, it's very easy to do so. Uh, and also geometry, finally, you wanted to create a, a cylindrical pancake or you wanted to create a, a, a brick-like whole cut meat structure or a fish fillet. Uh, different structures require different dimensions. So we are happy to take any user defined geometry. Uh, of course, given some limitations of the manufacturing process, we'll be try we'll attempt we'll do everything we can to reach the structure geometry that you, you are expecting. And we are actively currently researching a lot of FDA grass listed biomaterials. So always tune in with us, or try to contact us time to time for new materials that are coming into the availability. So we did two test cases because it's important for us to see the product in the action, uh, to believe that this product might work for your manufacturing process. So we, we partnered with our external academic research institutions. We also have an in internal cell culture facility. So we deal with both uh, different cell types here. So this is a work we, we performed in collaboration with the Tufts University uh, in US here. And uh, we created a prototype test sample. So we can see here the central disk, uh, the nanofibers, which we discussed in the previous, arranged neatly. Uh, and then there are multiple layers, like four stacks. So we gave the samples for testing and for the development with the Tufts University, and they did a phenomenal work. They took their newly developed bovine satellite cell culture. They currently mortalized those cells, and they seeded these cells on our scaffolds. And they they have seen that cells are attaching first thing, uh, addition and proliferation, and then uh, further differentiation. We can see clearly here cells are reaching the density that are requested required for a whole cut meat and what we see on the right side panel here the video is a confocal image put together the images creating a 3d uh, video uh, so they stained the myosin heavy chain that's a cell core and they also stained the 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 actin part of the cell and the dappy for nucleus everything putting together what we see here the vasculature that we created between the layers they remain intact during the 30 days of cell culture, this 25 days long culture in the with the periodic media exchange and handling the scaffold around and staining and everything. And the cells, this is static culture, so it's not a dynamic culture for more details. 
and the cells are issued the kind of densities and they expand around they differentiated directly on the scaffold avoiding cell harvest and then introducing other growth factors and uh, another structure so it, everything issued in a single process reaching the high densities and this is one one test case and the second test case is actually uh, can we use fish embryonic cells uh, or other fish stem cells or fish primary cells. And we gave several attempts. And here we can see some of our results. Again, uh, we took a scaffold. When we combine the embryonic cells on a monolayer of the fibers, so there are individual fibers, single, just thrown there to see if the cells like to attach, the, attach on them, then multiply on top of them. Uh, what we can see here clearly, the fish embryonic cells, they love to attach on our scaffolds, the edible materials. So these ingredients are very simple. There are no uh, complicated composition of the fiber, direct edible material, and the, you can see the cells attached and then proliferating across the fiber and then creating a tissue-like environment where they're trying to create their own ECM. Generally, fish muscle has the least amount of ECM, ECM in the entire species. And they are but very happy to attach and then grow into, expand or proliferate into multiple sites. And also when you create the 3D structure, uh, maybe it's a very bit difficult because uh, the protocols available for the fish cell analysis is very limited. So the staining is a big challenge along with the fiber. Fiber absorbs the stain and the cells absorb the stain. So staining uh, is a kind of a tricky activity. But what we can see here, if you follow my mouse, mouse pointer, uh, all these individual cells here, they're growing across the networks. So they even pull the fibers together, causing a little distortion in the scaffold, but they are reaching their own high densities here across the surface. So we clearly see that the even fish cells can be attached on the fibers into three-dimensional space and they create a 3D structure out of them. So these are the two successful test cases we have uh, covering both meat and seafood environment. So we are happy to try your own cell lines. And finally, um, with all this uh, information, maybe I'm not giving the complete picture of what we have developed so far here, but with the one-to-one -one phone calls or with the one-to-one -one meetings, and if you're further interested to explore our scaffolds and try try with uh, your own manufacturing, adapt it to your own manufacturing process, we have test samples available uh, with our edible material scaffolds uh, for quick and uh, quick screening. And further, we would like to offer some services here. So we are first of all open to the collaborative research environment because we have seen the task is uh, humongous. Uh, we are trying to recreate 350 million tons of meat per year and there is a lot of room and there's so much of need to be done for each species, each line. So there are always plenty of opportunities. Uh, we would like to openly collaborate with the other industries in the industry and bring forward the entire cultivated meat for industry forward. Um, if needed, if you're interested, we are also willing to take some burden off your manufacturing process. Let's say uh, you have the entire cell line developed, your media, culture media developed, and then you wanted to have your own material as a scaffold going inside. We would have, we are happy to do that uh, research for you because we already have the entire base established, facility established. We can have the fibers drawn, we can have the scaffolds developed, we can customize the scaffolds, we can bring in the biochemical cues, uh, we can create the structure so that you are, you are desiring. So we can take up the burden from you and uh, create this work at affordable level. At the end, uh, as a early stage startup company, really believing in the cultivated meat sector, uh, we love to contribute uh, to the cultivated meat revolution going on right now. We would like to see that entire industry going forward uh, with us. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions and any of your comments and suggestions also welcome for me. Thanks so much, Nadarada, for an excellent talk. Um, because we're a little bit short on time, I think we're going to move on um, and then we can come back and do a combined Q&A at the end, or if you want to respond to anything in the chat as well, you're welcome to. Sure, Claire. Um, and so uh, with that, let's move on to Kyle and Christopher. Yes, thank you. Let me share my screen here. So hopefully everyone can see my screen here. Uh, thank you to the Good Food Institute, uh, specifically Elliot, um, Claire, and Renee for uh, organizing this. Um, we're very excited to present on our technology at Optics Lab in Life. Uh, we will be focusing mostly on mechanobiology and the relevance to the uh, cellular agriculture space. Um, and I think, you know, Cytonest, you know, that was a great presentation. It feeds very nicely into what we can provide in terms of looking at the mechanics of these different scaffolds and biomaterials involved. Uh, in this uh, cultured meat revolution. 
So with that, I'm just going to present a little bit on the importance of mechanobiology and then some solutions that we can offer at Optics of Life with our uh, nano indentation technology to characterize these different biomaterials. So uh, the, the culture meat process, um, you know, I see there's a few different areas where, where biomechanics can play an uh, important role. Um, if you see here, this is kind of a schematic of this entire process. Uh, so we start off with a couple of different uh, sources of cells. It can be either from an animal, um, from a biopsy, or we can do IPSC, um, you know, cell sourcing. From that, we're going to differentiate it towards uh, different, you know, skeletal muscle types. Um, once we have our, our muscle cells and whatnot, we're going to put them in a bioreactor, and this is where the expansion is going to take place. Then once these are, you know, the, the numbers are increased, we're going to seed them on scaffolds, and from there, we're going to have our, our finalized uh, meat product. Now, there, like I mentioned, there's a few different upstream and downstream areas where these mechanics can play a role. I think the first one will be in this differentiation phase. Um, so going towards these different uh, cell lines, um, IPSCs, um, the, you know, the mechanics of these uh, scaffolds that they're seeding on um, can heavily influence differentiation of these cells in different types. So being able to look at these mechanical properties, uh, namely stiffness and viscoelasticity, again, will kind of dictate what type of cell that these uh, are turning into. From there, I think our, our second area that I'm going to focus on is the scaffold that we're seeding the cells on. Um, different you know, factors can influence this um, in terms of fiber density, alignment, um, and from there. And this is really going to allow you, again, to you know, improve this process and really allow for scale up and commercialization um, moving towards the, the final meat product, which brings me to more of the kind of downstream process of cultivated meat uh, and the importance of mechanics. And that's namely just to look at the stiffness, the elasticity of this final meat product. Um, this, you know, taste um, comes in heavily, but also texture will, will allow people to adopt this kind of as a new alternative to the uh, traditional meat um, harvesting. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit of more detail on these different points. And then again, uh, propose a solution to, to characterize the different mechanical properties um, that we, we see. So again, that upstream, so the scaffold biomechanics will play a huge role um, depending on the, is the pores, um, the fiber uh, you know, density alignment of these different scaffolds. These can be hydrogels, different inks. Um, they can be you know, fibrous. Um, looking at these different alignments and areas uh, where these cells can go and, and integrate will, will play you know, quite a large role in being able to tune these properties to make this environment very friendly and, and uh, make these cells very happy, again, will allow this uh, proliferation of, of the cells. Um, and our instruments allow us to you know, see exactly where all this is taking place. We integrate with microscopy. I'll obviously show a little bit down there. But being able to combine the mechanics with microscopy will really allow the design and fine tuning of these, these scaffolds that you're developing and eventually seeding. Uh, also to that will be the biodegradability of these scaffolds, so we can kind of see and design these um, kind of on the upstream, you know, see these different materials, how they uh, eventually degrade. Obviously, you know, that's going to be part of what the people are consuming on uh, this product. So again, fine tuning these different parameters will allow us to really, uh, you know, make these you know, scaffolds that will, will really allow the cells to thrive. And again, this will be very, very important to the commercialization and scale up um, of this, this technology. Um, I think, you know, the high throughput capacity, uh, which we can look at, um, will be important, again, because this is going to be on a large scale. Um, so Optics 11 Life, our nano indenters for mechanical screening, again, can be high throughput and automated and up to 296 well plates. So I think that's also will, will play quite a large role in really improving this process. You know, it is quite an expensive process. So again, optimizing these different parameters, these recipes, if you will, will really allow this become more affordable and will allow you know, us to be selling these different products for a, a reasonable price say at the grocery store or even in restaurants one day. <clears throat> um, and to that, the downstream, like I mentioned very briefly, you know, people are only going to, you know, the, the taste is one thing, but the texture will obviously play a huge role. And to that will be the stiffness, the elasticity of these different meat products. And then getting insights into the homogeneity of, of your, you know, your, your meat product. Are these cells evenly distributed in these scaffolds? Um, how are these different properties in terms of alignment, you know, cell culturing, different areas of pockets? Can we control all of this and make this a very homogeneous product? So you're not, you know, having different pockets of this final product where, say, the stiffness or this other viscoelastic properties differ. And then, again, control and tune these will really allow um, this, this uh 
cultured meat revolution to, to take off. So that's a little bit on the mechanics and kind of how they play a role in those three different areas, both upstream and downstream. Now, how can we look at and characterize these mechanics um, in kind of a high throughput way? Um, in Optics 11 Life, um, we have a potential solution to this. Um, it's via nano indentation. Um, so we are a, a Dutch company, just some quick background. Um, I'm calling in from our US office here in Boston. We've been around since 2011. Um, like I mentioned, we developed nano indentors integrated with microscopy um, for mechanical screening of various biomaterials. Um, that can be any type of biomaterial from a single cell to a scaffold, hydrogel, tissue, uh, anything within a given stiffness range and pretty much size we can look at and characterize in a, in a very simple and automated way. <clears throat> So a little bit on our core technology. So it's based off optical interferometry. And essentially what that means, you can see my cursor here on the bottom right. We have our probes. Um, so these are gonna make direct contact with your sample, be that your scaffold, be that a monolayer, be that a single cell. We're gonna have our probe tip make contact down here with your sample directly. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot a laser down and we're gonna bounce it off of our cantilever. Um, when our SIP is in contact with our sample, this cantilever is gonna bend and it's gonna bounce this laser back and there'll be a wave disruption. Our interferometer can pick this uh, wave shift up very, very precisely, keeping in mind the amount of force that's applied, we can determine how deep we indent or go into your sample. From that, this is how we determine the stiffness um, of these different samples that we're looking at. And again, this stiffness is gonna dictate how these cells are gonna perforate. So again, tuning these scaffolds, designing them in a perfect way uh, will be very important to the, the scale up and commercialization of, the, of this process. Um, to that, we can also look at the viscoelastic properties um, known as the storage and loss modulus, if you're familiar with uh, these bio, uh, biophysics terms. Um, and that'll be very important, the viscoelastic properties. Um, and to do this, we, we look at the uh, different frequency oscillations that we send when we're in contact with your sample. So not only can we get stiffness, we can get viscoelasticity, we can get adhesion, all these other properties that are gonna make sure these cells are happy in the environment that they're seated in. Uh, important to note, uh, this is a non-destructive method we're doing. So we're using very small amounts of force. So we're not gonna destroy your scaffolds. We're not gonna destroy your final products. Um, so we can take many, many repeat measurements on these different samples. Uh, ensure that we're you know not destroying them because it can be quite expensive but also if you want to take repeat measurements uh, we have that option as well um, these are different orders of magnitude and stiffness so we can measure anything in four orders of stiffness magnitude uh it's young modulus which we call stiffness um, also we can they're pre-calibrated and we can basically plug them in and out for any type of sample that we're looking at large or small uh, and this is because our tip sizes, they range in the order of the micron scale. So they're about three microns on the low end, all the way up to 250 microns in tip radius on the high end. So if you did have, you know, single cells you wanted to highlight within your, your uh, scaffold, you could definitely do that using a small tip size. If you want to, you know, indent over these pores uh, in your scaffold, you could use a larger tip size. Um, so I think the scale of our technology is very relevant to the, the cellular um, space being on that micron scale. Um, or if you did want to look at, say, where this fiber is, you can indent directly on that fiber if it's large enough. Or if there's a cluster of fibers, you can pinpoint this part of your, your scaffold and really understand the mechanics um, and stiffness where the scaffold alignment and density may differ. <clears throat> Um, kind of important as well, we can work in any medium. So this can be in air, um, but you know, most often people like to do it in the kind of physiological conditions. So it can be cell culture, it can be PBS, and it can be water. Um, so any medium we can work in, um, that is no problem um, for our devices. Um, and they're all reusable. So again, your consumable cost will be you know, quite, quite low. <clears throat> so there's different ways to make our indentations or our stiffness measurements. Um, so we can control all these different parameters in terms of the depth we're indenting into your sample. So if you have a very thin sample, we can tell our device to only go a few microns deep if we want. If you want to go deeper, you can also do that. We can also control the amount of force or load we're applying on your sample. Um, so again, setting all these parameters to be consistent will allow you to, again, make different repeat measurements and gain confidence in the uh, reproducibility of these results that you are getting. That's uh, doable for both the stiffness and the viscoelasticity, which we call the dynamic oscillatory or the DMA, uh, dynamic mechanical analysis profiles. 
Um, very important function would be uh, some mapping of these stiffness areas and this elastic um, on your sample. So you can set up these matrix scans, uh, which are grids essentially, however large or close together you want to be. Um, so every square you see here is a different stiffness reading. Um, and again, these step sizes between points can be as small as a few microns, or it can be numerous microns, or even on a larger scale, it can be up to millimeters or even centimeters. Um, so there's really no limit to how you can design your experiment based on what sample you were looking at. Um, so this allows us in a very rapid way to get a ton of data within a localized area. Um, so not only can you, you know, gain confidence in the reproducibility of this data, but this also allows you to get insights into the heterogeneity or homogeneity, hopefully, of your samples that you're looking at. Now, when we combine this with microscopy, we can see exactly where we're drawing these stiffness maps um, on your sample live. So if there were a bunch of fibers, you know, embedded within your, your hydrogel or whatever your scaffold is, we can see directly where these stiffness values correlate with the microscopy. And this really allows you to understand and design your uh, materials better. You can do this in 2D, also in 3D. And we can also look at the topography, you know, see if different areas of topography can influence these different mechanical properties with the end goal, of course, organizing and developing these materials that will make these cells in their happiest state, uh, which allows the proliferation, differentiation, and scale up of this uh, process. Here's a couple of specs that I uh, touched upon briefly. Um, for some of you folks that are not are familiar with the physics side of things, um, the stiffness range, 10 Pascal to a gigapascal, this is quite a large range of stiffness. So this is essentially down to subcells, um, subcellular level, uh, we can do nuclei of cells, all the way um, up to uh, you know, early forming bone, which obviously isn't relevant to you, but a very, very large stiffness range. Um, and should any type of material that you're looking at will fall very easily within this uh, stiffness range we look at. Different tip sizes we can look at as well. And then our imaging capabilities. So it's standard with a uh, phase contrast and bright fields inverted microscopy, allowing us again, pinpoint these specific areas and design our scaffolds um, accordingly. We can also upgrade to fluorescence. So if you did want to you know, stain these different fibers, the different fiber density alignment and how the mechanical properties change, that's also doable as well. Um, and then we can also throw in some environmental controls. So uh, we have temperature control as a standard. And then for you know, longer duration experiments, we can also do humidity and CO2 control. So this is what we call our environmental kind of control module. <clears throat> so here's uh, some properties that we can look at. Um, you know, these modules, which is our stiffness, storage and loss again, which is visual elasticity. And then we can also look at others such as stress relaxation, creep, and adhesion uh, as well. So you're going to measure your data. Um, we have a couple of different softwares to analyze these results. Uh, and from there, we can export them um, not only on the back end in large text files, we can also have our, our data viewer uh, software where you can see these in 3D and make these different graphs, histograms, and get all this uh, statistical analysis. So this brings us to our kind of high throughput inverted, um, com uh, compatible with inverted microscopy, our Pavone. So we can load up the 296 well plates, uh, but it doesn't have to be in that format. We can do a petri dish for larger samples. We can do a microscope slide. We can even do 24 well. It doesn't really matter what type of well plate configuration you have. It goes up to 296 well. If you did have different, you know, scaffold, uh, you know, formulas, anything like that, you can see how these different parameters and formulations change over a, a row and see again how these mechanical properties differ and then how the cells react accordingly. <clears throat> So this is what it looks like in a lab. So we'll load our, our sample into here. We'll have our interferometer uh, here, our controller box. And then this uh, computer is where we're really going to control and set up these different experimental profiles. Here's a quick look at the software. So on this screen, you'll have your live microscopy. And then there's other buttons over here for organizing these experiments and setting them up to be very customized, if you will. So on that live microscopy, you'll have your, your sample live. So these are some microspheres. It can be microcarriers. It can be your single cells, or it can even be your, your tissues or your scaffolds directly. Uh, you can see your fibers in here. If there were fibers, this is an example even of an organoid. So really any type of biomaterial we can look at. And then we have our probe here in this outline. So what we can do, these stages move automatically. So if we tap on an area that we want the stage to move to, this probe will move directly to this area and then we can tap and run an indentation very, very quickly and easily that way. Um, now this is a very good way to hit very small things such as cells or you know different areas of your, your fibers of scaffolds. We can also make these maps, like I mentioned previously, our, our matrix scan maps. We can draw them directly on our area 
say there's here, there's some fibers. I want to draw my, my uh, grid right here, and then it'll go and hit all these points. And we can image this and save it and really understand from both perspectives from microscopy and mechanical analysis how these properties are uh, changing. <laughs> Um, this is a little peek at our fluorescence module. So again, if you did want to stain these different parts of the you know, cell, different tissues, different fibers, that's also doable um, to really allow you to, to visualize the different components of your scaffolds. This is really can really set up our experiment and make it very high throughput, very automated. So we have our kind of experimental protocols over here on the right. And this is how we can go well to well and really customize this based on your specific needs. Um, so different commands you can put in um, to basically tell it to go to one well, go to the transit and focal height, get our uh, mi uh, microscope in view. Then we have an auto fine surface, which is very important to make sure we're starting out of contact. Um, and then we can go to our matrix scan, which is going to be a 50 by 50 grid. And then when it's done with that, go to the next well and do the next thing and then the next thing. Now, if you did have very specific points or cells or small things you wanted to add on, you can save all those things you tag as a coordinate list and throw that coordinate list in place or in addition to this matrix scan, and then it'll hit all those automated as well. So like I mentioned, you're gonna go through, figure out your well plate configuration. Once that's all set, you can mess with your indentation profile. So you can say how deep you want it to indent, how much time you want it to take, and then you can go from there. And then when that's all set up, it can pretty much go in automated fashion and get you these mechanical results that you're looking for. <laughs> So that's for uh, you know setting up these automated experiments. Now, if you did have your your scaffold or cells or any type of you know small thing live directly, you see here's a 50 micron scale. We can tap very easily. It's called the move to point function. We'll basically tap there. We'll hit move to point. Our probe moves over with the stages, and we're going to run our experiment. It'll do an indentation very quickly. We see our Z stage go down, and just like that, you're going to get a stiffness reading on that part of the sample you're clicking. So again, it can be very, very simple to set up, but you can also customize it and make it more sophisticated, if you will. I like to say that it kind of services both a, a beginner user, if you really just care about the stiffness, we can give you that. Uh, or a more experienced user, you know, you want to set up these sophisticated experiments, you even want to analyze these results on your own, you can do that and export these results in, in large text files too. <clears throat> Um, and then a quick look at how we get these results. So these are some load indentation curves, uh, just to give you a peek at the kind of biophysics side of things. So we're gonna analyze our load versus indentation. And from this is how we get our stiffness in the red, which is the part we're fitting. We have our indentation profiles here on the right, our load curve, and then our residual plots. So this is for the stiffness. And then very briefly, for the uh, viscoelastic properties, we have storage and loss modulus, uh, which is E prime, E double prime. Uh, different frequencies associated, which is the viscoelastic component. And then again, that same profile, just with those little squiggly lines, which are those different oscillations we do while holding, uh, holding contact with your uh, sample. So again, very, very easy and uh, versatile instrument that allows you to measure many biomaterials from cells, tissues, scaffolds, anything like that. Uh, really allows you to, to optimize these formulations uh, and design of these scaffolds to be the best conditions to make these cells happy and eventually scale up to a more affordable um, you know solution for the, the cultivated meat uh, area. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much, uh, Nataraja and Kyle, for two really excellent talks. Very excited about what both of you are working on. And thank you to everyone in the audience for some really good questions. Um, and we will see you next month. <laughs>